This brown goopy material looks like mud, but it's alive. It's made of fire ants. Solenopsis invicta, that's a Latin word for undefeated. And indeed, these fire ants have just survived a major threat to their colony. Their mound was shoveled into a bucket that was slowly filled with water. But they survived, and the reason they did is the same reason they were brought to this particular place. It's not a zoology lab or an ecology study. This is the engineering school at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I guess my first question is, what makes fire ants interesting to a bunch of engineers? Um, fire ants are one of the few insects capable of building big structures with their bodies. And they can do it by linking their bodies together. That means fire ants aren't just animals, they can also be seen as a sort of material that you can test like a fabric or a gel. And you can trace that behavior back to their evolutionary history. Red imported fire ants are native to floodplains in South America, where the rainy season regularly inundates their underground homes. The ants that stick together and stay with the queen have a better chance of reproducing, so they've gotten really good at basically holding hands and floating until they find a new place to live. In the 1930s or 40s, shipping brought fire ants to the U.S., and they've spread across the southern states. Alabama officials are warning of something that, to me, is straight out of a nightmare. It's a pile of fire ants clustered together to survive. Now you can find this invasive species alongside roads in cities like Atlanta. Easy access for the researchers at Georgia Tech, who've done pretty much anything you could think to do to a colony of fire ants and still call it science. We fed ants iodine, which is radioactive. Flash freezing this with liquid nitrogen and then elastic band to the waist of another ant. And then you coat them in gold. <laughs> but that's just standard. They've created mathematical models to describe the ant's behavior, and they characterize the ant balls as a viscoelastic material, which means they have properties of both a fluid and a solid. They're a solid in that they're elastic. So for example, if I you know, take a spring, you squish it, it'll give you back the energy. But they also act like a viscous fluid when under stress, breaking and reforming links to dissipate energy in a way that resembles a slow flow. And that's basically how fluids work. They have very small uh, and weak bonds everywhere, uh, like water has these hydrogen bonds. It's because the bonds can break and then reheal really easily. You can see this happening when they're dropped in water. Within a few minutes, they've spread out like a drop of dye. In their study of the towers that fire ants build after floods, whose team found that the ants release their links when the stress is more than two to three times the weight of an ant. That's when they transition from solid to fluid behavior. They're not sure why the ants build these towers, but it may have to do with the fact that ants are more water repellent when they're linked together, which is how they stay afloat during a flood. They link their bodies so closely together, they actually generate a weave, like a, a waterproof fabric. So air bubbles actually have to do work to escape. The ants aren't drowning because they can get air from those bubbles. What's so incredible about swarming animals is that there's no leader directing the colony to do this. And that sort of decentralized collective action may be a model for future technologies. Modular robotics has been the dream of roboticists. And they're still working on it. But, uh, you know, these ants have had a couple million years and uh, robotics have only been around for 40. So I think, you know, robots that really, you know, do act like a fluid and like a solid, I'm hoping that this work will inspire more people to pursue that kind of thing.